Okay. So, um, so this is uh, again, uh, welcome to Kenyatta University. And um, uh, as we go through uh, IP version six, we yesterday talked about IP version four. And today we are going to learn why is it that we are moving from IP version uh, four to six? Why are we making the uh, the move? It is important that we get to learn uh, the very reason why. Now we know that IP version four were 4.3 billion addresses. The world has more than doubled that number, and the world is about you know 8.9, 7.9 billion. That's about 8 billion people in the planet. And um, we have more gadgets than ever before. We have, you know, Internet of Things is here. And um, it's also important, you know, basically just to know that um, we have, you know, more people uh, that need to uh, use uh, 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 IP version 6. Yeah. And so uh, the thing is, I want us to just check on this and just see to it that we learn a better version of this. So to start us off, let's um, look at the uh, what is going to be the content of our learning today. So uh, this is IP addressing, IPv6 addressing, and so we are going to implement an IP version 6 addressing scheme. So we'll explain the need for IPv6 addressing. We'll explain how IPv6 addresses are represented, very important. We'll uh, compare the types of uh, IPv6 addresses. Uh, we'll also configure a static uh, global unicast address and link local IPv6 addresses. Those are two, two other types of IPv6 addresses. And then finally, we'll explain how to configure global unicast addresses automatically or dynamically. Or dynamically. And so we'll also configure a link local addresses automatically and we'll uh, identify IP6 addresses, especially the multicast address. And finally, we'll implement uh, subnetting for IPv6, which is very simple and just derived from what we learned about in IP version 4. So the first thing we want to talk about is what are some of the issues that, you know, uh, are making us to move from IPv4 to 6. Now, the world is obviously running out of uh, IP version 6, 4 addresses, and that makes IPv6 to be the successor of version 4. Uh, and this is simply because IPv6 has much larger uh, space, 128 bit uh, space, and um, IPv6 is going to fix some of the limitations uh, and enhance IP before. Uh, now, you know that there's an increased internet population uh, since uh, uh, 1978 to date, and this is a gradual uh, uh, occurrence that we have always seen. We also know that there were very limited address space for IPv4, and while using IPv4, we have been using NAT, which is network address translation, to translate from public to private and private to public, which is basically what it has been doing is that it has been, um, you know, trying to slow down the process of depletion of IP version uh, six devices. I mean, of IP version four addresses. Now, with the coming of Internet of Things, where we connect the unconnected, uh, all these factors drive us to the fact that uh, it has never been ready for us to, uh, more than now, for us to move to IP version 6. And so, clearly, if you look at the five regional Internet registry, we can see that version 4 has already been exhausted, ladies and gentlemen. So look at North America, whose regional internet registry is uh, Irene. They exhausted their IP4 addresses in July 2015. All right. Uh, the South American 
Regional Internet Registry exhausted their IP4 addresses in April 2011. Look at Europe and the Middle East. They exhausted their IP version 4 addresses in September 2012, right? And look at the Asian countries. They exhausted their IPv4 addresses in June 2014, all right? And for Africa, and our regional internet registry is called AFRINIC, we exhausted our addresses in, uh, the projection date was actually 2020, which is here, and you realize that has already passed. And I remember mentioning to you guys that uh, in Kenya here, uh, which is of course part of AFRINIC, the government through the CA, Communications Authority, had already announced that it is now time for most service providers and larger telecommunication organizations to begin the transition to IPv6 from version 4. And, you know, because the time is up, you know, for us to do this, guys. And for that means that uh, the Western countries, they have already begun the transition process. The African countries are just doing so, and that's why currently both IP version 4 and version 6 coexist within the same network. And, you know, this coexistence will take several years, and in the, uh, it will not be in the near future. It will take several years because the IT guys have all to be trained to handle IPv6, and that is why you guys have made a very wise decision to begin the training session, the training phase. And this is what the government will need everyone to be doing. All right. Now, to help in the transition, because this transition is not an abrupt transition, it's going to happen gradually. So IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, has created various protocols and tools to help most network administrators to migrate their networks to IP version 6. And so we have three migration techniques that uh, we are using to support this, um, this, 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 this process. And so the first one is called dual stock. Dual stock is a situation whereby um, our devices can run both IP version 4 and IP version 6 and i'm gonna demonstrate that just right now i'm gonna show you that my laptop can be configured with both ip version 4 and ip version 6. so i'm gonna this is uh, for ethernet i'm gonna check the properties here and then i if you look at this part very well we have a place for Internet Protocol version 4 and Internet Protocol version 6, all right? And I'm going to get inside them, so I can just click version 4, or I could double click it, or I could click it once, and then I click Properties here. And you can see where we configure IP version 4. The first one is for DHCP, where IP addresses are uh, done automatically. Then the second one is for manual configuration, where this is where you put the IP address right here. Subnet mask will be here, and the default gateway will be here. And even the DNS servers, okay, the DNS server addresses will actually be here. If you have to, that's it. That is for IP version 4. If I can close this and I go to the one for IP version 6, I'm just double click on it, you realize that we also have a space for configuring IP version 6. This is for automatically or dynamic addressing. And this is the place for manual IP assignment, where this is where we put slash 64 here. We actually just put 64. This is the part where we put the long. You can see the IP6 is long, 128 bits, and it's going to fit here. And the default gateway is also long. It's going to fit here. And the DNS server are also long to be configured here. So this is part of the transition process where my device can be configured to carry both IP version 4 and version 6, and they can run simultaneously. That's called dual stock. Then we have tunneling as another migration technique. Tunneling is where you can transport 
IPv6 packets over IPv4 network. What do I mean? We know that most networks are still IP version 4. And so few networks that are already IPv6, remember they must want to communicate with the rest of the world, which are running IPv4. So we can tunnel IP version 6 packets inside a network that is running IPv4. And this is done through a process called encapsulation, which we did talk about. All right. So that means obviously the IPv6 packets will be inside IPv4 packets. Then the last process is called translation. In translation, this is whereby you have two types of networks. One network is running IPv4, another one is running IPv6. So what's going to happen when the packets for IPv6 reach the boundary of the two networks? The IPv6 packets will be translated because they have IPv6 address. They will be translated to IPv4, and IPv4 will be translated to IPv6. You know, we call that NAT64 network address translation 64. And you know, this will actually basically happen. Now, we do not have such things like translation in IPv6, and that's why NAT itself is not in IPv6. So please note how to identify these three transition methods, dual stock tunneling and translation. These are very, very important. Now, let's look at how do you represent. I know I, had, I have talked to you guys before about this, but let's see, how do we, how do we always, you know, uh, the format for IPv6? We, now, we know that IP version 6 address has 128 bits, unlike the counterpart version 4, which has version 1, I mean 32 bits. And IPv4 is already written in decimal, like 192.168. something. something. IPv6 is always written in hexadecimal. Now, since hexadecimal numbers, since hexadecimal numbers, uh, include the first 10 decimal numbers. That is from 0 to 9. And then we have A, B, C, D, E, F. Six of those numbers. In total, there are 16 numbers. Those ones form what we call. That is, um, uh, those form 16 hexadecimal numbers. So those A, B, C, D, E, F, they are actually case insensitive. They are not case sensitive, and that means you can use either small or capital letters to just write them. All right. Now, it's also important to note that um, IPv6 before are always uh, having octets, you know, and there are four octets. First, second, third, and fourth octet. IPv6 are not called octets. They are actually called hextet. So hextet is not an official term. And uh, we it's made up of eight hextets separated, not by decimal point, but by a colon, by a colon, okay? Now, this is how we represent uh, IP version six. This is how we represent IP version six here. You can see first extent separated with a colon, second extent, third extent, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. So a total of eight hextets. All right. Now I need you to note that these numbers are hexadecimal numbers. They are not decimal numbers. Which means if you can remember in a chapter behind there, I think chapter five or something, where we were translating from were translating from decimal to hexadecimal, to binary. And we were using the four numbers, 1, 2, 4, 8, or 8, 4, 2, 1. And if we're given a number like B, a number like B, B represents what? 11. B represents 11, because A represents 10. B represents 11. C represents 12. So if you take, let's say, C, which is 12, and we want to write it into binary. We ask ourselves between eight, four, two, one. Um, which numbers, if you add, will get twelve? 
we know that 8, 8 plus 4 is 12. And so we'll put 1 under 8 and 1 under 4. And we put 0 under under 2 and 0 under 1. So we end up with the 1, 1, 0, 0. So each of these numbers are actually hexadecimal numbers. And you can write them to get 16. Each of them can give us four binaries. Each of them can give us four binaries. And so if each of them can give us four, and there are four in total, four times four is 16. So each and every part, which is called a hextet, can actually give us 16 bits. So if you multiply 16 times eight, that's how you get 128 bits, 128 bits. This is how represent it. But this method is a bit longer because I don't know whether I had talked to you guys about how to shorten them, and I think we are going to learn about that here. The 128 bits can actually be shortened to be much shorter. We can actually shorten them, and let's see that here. Let's say a number has 0, 1, A, B. The first rule is to omit the leading zeros. Leading zero means omit the bits that come. If there are any zeros that come at the beginning of every extent, you can omit them. If there are any zeros that come at the beginning of each hextet, just omit them. So, a good example. If you have 0, 1, A, B, you omit the first zero and it's become 1, A, 1, A, B. If you have 0, 9, F, 0, you don't touch the zero at the end, only the zeros that come at the beginning. Even if there are two, you can omit all of them. So, 0, 9, F, 0 will become 9, F, 0. 0, A, 0, 0 will become A00 because we are only checking at zero that comes at the beginning. 00AB will become AB, okay? And you can see that even down here, we have 2001, that will become 2001. We can't touch the zeros because they are at the middle of any two hex, hexadecimal numbers. 0DB8 will become DB8. 000, if all of them are zeros, omit the first three and only remain with one here, all right? Since these ones are all ones, so they become ones. These are four zeros, so you meet the first three. Four zeros, omit the first three. Four zeros, omit the first three. Zero, two, zero, zero, omit the first zero, and you have two, zero, zero there. Now, uh, that is the first rule. The second rule. For the second rule, if we have what is called contiguous zeros, contiguous zeros are zeros that follow each other, okay? Zeros that follow each other. These zeros, you can re represent them using a single double colon, using a double colon, all right? So the thing is this, I know we have more zeros here and we have also zeros here. Choose where there are more zeros. Ideally, you could also put the double colon here, but we want to make, remember our objective is to make the address as short as possible. So we represent all these zeros by just using a double colon, a double colon, and you can see the double colon is right here. So this will become 2001, colon DB8, colon zero, colon 1111, double colon 200. The double colon can only be used once in each address. That is a very important point, okay? Why so? Because the machines, laptops, tablets, mobile phone, everything, wherever they see a single or a short address like this, the machine is always aware that here we have one hex set where there's a zero here, so it's gonna fill it with three more zeros. But where there's a double colon, it's gonna fill it with zeros, total number of zeros, so that the binaries can be all to 128. So it's going to include it. I mean, it's going to fill it with zeros to make it to be uh, 128 bits. Because whenever a machine is given such an address, the machine converts everything here to bits, to binaries. That is a funny thing about the machines. The machine will convert all these ones um, the machine will convert all this uh, binary. So that is one thing that you know. So please know 
how to shorten uh, our addresses. All right, so moving forward, moving forward. Let's look at types of IP version 4 address. These types, we have seen some of them, but we are meeting one today. We have unicast, multicast, and anycast. All right, you realize this time round, we don't have broadcast. We don't have broadcast. We have replaced broadcast with anycast. Why? Because IP version 6 addresses, don't have broadcast addresses. IP version 6 addresses, they don't have broadcast addresses. Instead of broadcast, we have what is called anycast. So as usual, unicast is used for one-to-one -one communication. Multicast is used for one-to-many or to a group of uh, devices. Anycast is a funny address for IP6. Imagine of uh, going to Safaricom and you tell Safaricom, I have three friends. We want you to make for us three SIM cards with the same number. Imagine that. Three SIM cards having the same number so that whenever someone sends any of them a text message, all of them will receive it. Whenever someone calls one of them, all of them will receive the call. So any case, it's a type of address that is assigned, same address assigned to multiple devices, okay? So that wherever you send a uh, 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 message is sent to one device, all of us will contain it. So like I said, IPv6 does not have broadcast addresses. That is something important for you guys to note. Now, we have what is called a prefix length. Prefix length. A prefix length is an equivalent to the subnet mask in IPv4. All right? And, uh, it's always just like we represent IPv4 in terms of slash notations. We say slash 24, slash 30, slash uh, 29, slash, you know, 28, slash 8, we did yesterday. In IP version 6, its prefix length, or what we call subnet mask in IPv4, cannot be written in decimal or in hexadecimal. It's always, always written in slash notation. And the most common one currently is slash 64. But as time moves on, we are going to have more and more slashes. So currently, all addresses you're going to be seeing are slash 64. So it also has what is called, yesterday we saw a network portion and a host portion. Here, the network portion is called the prefix here. And the host portion is called the interface ID, interface ID for the prefix line, OK? And the host portion is always 64 bits, and the network portion is also 64, which makes it a total of 128 bits. Okay. Now, we have been told it is strongly recommended to use this 64 bit interface ID for most networks. This is because uh, Slack, which we talk about today, stateless address auto configuration, uses 64 bit for it to make its interface ID. And it makes submitting easier to create and manage. Of course, we will talk about that. Don't worry about that. Uh -huh. Now, it is important also to look at other types of IP version 4. Sorry, IPv6. Now, IP version 6 has so many types of addresses, as we shall see. Of course, we have what is called global unicus address. It's always called the GUA. GUA global the unicast addresses it has what's called the link local address lla link local address it's always called lla it has the loopback address okay it has something called the unique local address eula and many more so let's first talk about the global unicast address and what is it so the global unicast address it's an equivalent of the public IPv4. This is this is the equivalent of the public IPv4 addresses. And this is the one that is globally unique and it, it can be routed uh, to the internet. This is what we refer to as public IP in version 6. Then we have the LLA, a link local address. Now, this is another type of address that is required for every IPv6 enabled device. And it is only used to communicate within the same ne network. 
within the same link or network. OK, but the only thing is that link local address are not routable. They're not routable to the Internet and they are normally just used within the link within a network. OK. Now. We have what is called the unique local address. EULA. So unique local address, this is the equivalent of the private IPv4 addresses. Is the equivalent of private IPv4 addresses. Now, I want you to, to know how to identify each type of IPv6. Because IPv6 is still new. And since you need to know how to identify them, and even for your exam, they're going to bring for you addresses and they tell you to identify them. So let's start with the unique local address. Every time, Every time you see an address, every time you see an address, beginning with FC or FD, huh? so long as it begins with FC or FD, just know that is a private, that is a unique local address. That is a EULA. Okay. Now, like I'd said, this is the equivalent of private IP before addresses, but it does not mirror everything. Uh, unique local addresses are used for local addressing just within the site or between limited number of sites, a few sites which private addresses cannot do. The unique local addresses can be used for devices that will never need to access another network. All right. And unlike in private IP4 addresses, then the devices can still be able to access the internet, but in the help of using with the help of NAT to translate them. Eh? Then unique local addresses, they are not globally routed or translated to global IPv6 addresses. And this is unlike private, which are always translated to public IPv4 addresses. These are a few differences that we have uh, these devices. Now, one of the other reasons why we always use private addresses is to attempt to secure or hide our network from uh, some risks, okay? But this was not the intention in unique local addresses. So, you get to see some uh, few differences here and there. Some of the things that make uh, IP uh, unique local addresses very unique. Let's talk about the global unique address, which is called the GUA. This is the public. This is the equivalent of the public IP version four. Now, um. Global Unicas address, IPv6 global Unicas address, they are globally unique and they are routable to the internet, on the IPv6 internet, okay? And currently, for countries that are already using IPv6, their IPv6 addresses only start with either two or three, like we have been seeing, and we shall see today, 2001 colon something. So most of the addresses currently start with two or, or, or they start with three. OK, so and currently, by the way. Uh, IT uh, uh, IANA has only provided an eighth of all the IPv6 addresses, an eighth of uh, 340 and decillion. Only an eighth of them are currently in the out in the public domain used by those companies that are already using IPv6. So the global Unix addresses. is divided into three portions. We learned that in IPv4. We only have the host portion and network portion. In IP version 6, we have uh, three portions. We have uh, three portions. Now, okay, we have three portions, and um, this is important because we need to just make to know how to differentiate this from IP. Uh, from I, I, IP version 6 and 4. Now, it's important to note that in IP version 4, we have, you know, host and network portion, but IP version 6, we also have network and host portions, but they have different names, and we have an additional portion. So the network portion in, in the GLUA is called global routing prefix. This is the network portion. The host portion in GUA is called the interface ID, but we have an additional portion here called the subnet ID, by the way. Um, the global routing prefix, which is the network portion, 
it's represented by the first three hexets. The first three hexets, which is about 48 bits. The subnet ID is always the fourth hexet. The fourth hexet is the where the subnet ID lies. And then the remaining four hexets are the interface ID, are the interface uh, ID. All right. Now, that is exactly what I was explaining here. The global routing prefix, which is the network portion. This is only the part that is provided by the ISP to the customer or to the site. OK, the subnet ID is where we do. We will do subnetting this is where we will do subnetting. And then the interface ID is like the host portion. Of our of our networks. I talked about the link local and the link local address, which are only used for communication within the same link or within the same network. So this is a network. This is a network. Each of them will have their own link local address. So they are not routable to the internet and um, they cannot be, of course, uh, uh, routed to the internet. Now, how do you represent? Like we have already seen unique local starts with FC or FD. Global unicast address starts with two or three. Link local addresses, if you want to identify them, you look at any address that begins with FE8. FE8. FE8 is how you identify the link local address. FE8. That's how we identify the link local address. All right. So that's how we do a representation of them. Let's look at how do we configure a static address, a static IPv6 global unicast address. Very simple. You just need to go to the interface. You say interface gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0, or you can say interface G0 slash 0 slash 0. Then you say IPv6 address, IPv6 address, and you put your address 2001 colon DB8 colon a card colon 1 double colon 1 slash 64. So you put the slash together here in IPv6, and then you activate the interface. You activate the, the interface. Okay. I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, I already showed you guys how, where to configure IPv6. You put the IPv6 address here. You put 64 here, and then you put the default gateway. And if you have DNS, you actually put it uh, right there. For uh, the link local address as well, when you want to configure it, you get into the interface gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0. Of course, at the global configuration mode. Then IPv6 link local is different. You say IPv6 address. FE8, you'll be given, of course, the link local will always be given. FE8, double colon 1, colon 1. You must put the word link hyphen local here. You must put the word link hyphen local. Then you say no, no shutdown. Okay. Now, the link local address, since it is only unique to the link, you can always configure link local on every other link you have in the network. So long as it's unique on that port common link, okay? But the best practice is to create different link local on each and every interface of the router to make it easy to identify the router and the specific interfaces and the specific interfaces. Now, I want to I want to do a small demonstration on how do we configure this link local addresses. Let me just do a small demonstration right here. Okay. So let's say that this is our network here. We have this. Um, um, this is a router with three networks, one network connected to the internet, one is connected to the upper LAN, and the other one is connected to the lower LAN PC2. So we want to configure some interfaces here. So let's see that here. Uh, hey, let me just zoom this in. All right, so I can just uh, remove this. And uh, we check on this. So we are told, configure and activate IPv6 on the gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 0 interface. 
with the following addresses. So we are given to use the short form G000 as the interface name. So we say interface G0 slash 0 slash 0, enter. We configure the link local first. We say IP V6 address F8 double colon 1 colon 1. You must say link hyphen local. Okay, you see how we configure IPv6. Then we configure the global Linux address. You say IPv6 address 2001 colon TV8 colon a card colon 1 double colon 1 slash 64. Please note the link local does not have slash 64. Do not that. The link local you must put link hyphen local. So IP6 address 2001 colon TB8 colon a card colon 1 double colon 1 slash 64. Enter. To activate the interview, say no. Shut down. You can see the interface has come up and then we need to exit. Uh, this place, and we are given to configure another interface, G001. So say interface G0 slash 0 slash 1 IPv6 address FE8 double colon 2 colon 1 link hyphen local. Then you say for the global Unicast address, GUA IPv6 address 2001 colon DB8 colon a card colon 2 double colon 1 slash 64. All right. We activate the interface. No shut down. And uh, what did I say? Oh, wrong spelling of no shut down. So no, no shut down. Then is exit the interface. Exit. And we have another interface here. You say interface S0 uh, slash 1 slash 0. Enter IPv6 address. FE8 double colon 3 colon 1 link hyphen local enter IPv6 address for the global Unicast address 2001 colon DB8 uh, colon a card colon 3 double colon 1 slash 64 Enter. Activate the interface. No shut down. And then we exit. And we are done. All right. So that is very easy configuring of IP version 6 addresses there. And uh, that's amazing one there. That's amazing one over there. So that's how we configure IP version 6 addresses. Now that's how we manually configure IP version 6 addresses. Now, what happens if this IP version 4 has automatic way of configuring them, which we call DHCP. We call it DHCP, which is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Why not have the same thing for IP version 6? All right. Now, we learned yesterday that IP version 4 has something that we call a PIPA. A PIPA, which means if a device uh, uh, using IP version 4 cannot locate the DHCP server, it assigns itself an IP address 
called APIPA, called APIPA, which means automatic private IP addressing, which means automatic private IP addressing. Now, uh, that, that IP address is acquired without the use of a DHCP server, but it cannot be used by the device to access the internet. Why? Because it's private. So you see, obviously, it cannot help the IPv4 device. Guess what? IP version 4, IP version 4 can also acquire IP version 4 can also acquire an IP version 4. Uh, I mean, IPv6 can also acquire an address automatically without the services of DHCP version 6 server. The only difference is that the IP version 6 device will use it to access the internet. Did I, did I say that? IP version 4 can acquire an address without the DHCP server and it's private, it cannot be used to connect to the internet. But IP version 6 can do the same thing, but that address is actually legitimate and it can be used to access the internet. That is important for us to note. Now, having said that, that is where we want to look for dynamic addressing for IPv6 global Unix addresses. Because uh, since in IP version 4, there's only one type of dynamic addressing. Actually, there are two types. The other one is a PIPA, which acquires a private address, cannot be used to connect to the internet. But of course, the other one is DHCP version 4, which is used to provide the addresses uh, uh, to the device. IP version 6 has three methods, whereas IP version 4 has two. So IP version 6, um, can also obtain an address dynamically through what is called ICMP version 6, Internet Communication Message Protocol. Internet Communication Message Protocol. All right. So IP version 4 can also acquire a, 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 a public IP using the ICMP v6. Now, ICMP uh, uses two messages. The first message is called RS message. It's called router solicitation. From the meaning of the word to solicit, if I have, if I'm having um, an orphanage and I want to look for money, I will say I want to solicit for money. I want to seek for money. I want to look for money from friends uh, and well wishes to be able to support the, the orphanage. So IPv6 devices or host devices always use the router solicitation, the RS message, which is sent to any router that is configured for IPv6. Whenever a router receives an RS message, the router responds with an RA message. And RA message, guys, is a big deal. Why is RA message is a big deal? It's because the a PC using IPv6 needs to acquire an IPv6 address from the network. They just need to send an RS message. And by sending an RS message, they need to get an RA message because of what? Because the RA message carries everything that it needs to get an IPv6 global Linux address. So the IPv6 RA message from the router will be everything that every PC needs. Why? Because it will carry the network prefix, that is the network uh, portion of the address or the network address. It will carry the prefix length, that is like the subnet mask. It will carry the default gateway. It will obviously carry the DNS server addresses and the domain names, all right? And so this is, the RMH is a big deal. It's very useful for the devices. Now, the RA provides three methods of configuring an IPv6 GUA address. The RA is very important because it provides three 
methods. And today, we learn those three methods. And I tell you my first parable today. Like I had mentioned to you guys, I use parables a lot for teaching. And uh, people people find them, you know, very easy for, for learning. I'm, uh, I hope you are also going to find my parables helpful for your learning. So the first method is called the slack. The first method is called slack. And slack basically means stateless address auto configuration. Stateless address auto configuration. That's the first method. The second method is called slack with stateless DHCP version 6 server. Slack with a stateless DHCP version 6 server. And the last method is called stateful DHCP version 6. Stateful DHCP version 6. I'm going to explain later on about stateful and stateless. So let me let me put this into context, guys. And here is my story. So imagine of uh Three students. These ones are high school students. Eh? Three students, uh, or even university students. Three university students. Now, these students, they come from different backgrounds. Okay? These students come from very different backgrounds. One comes from a very rich background. One is from a richer background. One is from a poor. Those are the two extremes from a poor uh, background, poor family, and the other one is from a middle to do family, all right? Now, uh, the one that comes from, uh, uh, so we have poor family, rich family, and middle to do. So these students, they close, and they're going for a holiday, and uh, 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 after about one month, they come back for another semester. So when they come back for another semester, when they close, here what happens. This is where my point is. When these three students close school or the semester, they've already done the end, end, of, uh, end of semester exam. They've done the end of semester exam and they now close uh, and they go home. Now, these three students reach home. When they reach home, they get different uh, impressions. The student who is from a rich family, when they reach home, you know, they have no idea, you know, that next semester fees needs to be thought about. Uh, they need to already start thinking about uh, the uh, shopping money for the next semester. That is not of their business. These students, when they close, what they think of is they are going for a holiday in Dubai. You know, they are going for uh, different vacations. You know, from Dubai, they can move to Cape Town. Then they go to Israel, you know. So these students, they, they immediately switch from school. And it is their parents' business to think about where the school fees will come from and all that. So it's not on their worries. Let's see the students from a poor family. The students from a poor family, the moment they reach home, their parents are going to ask them, you know, um, you know, you need to start thinking about how you'll pay school fees for next semester. And the parents will tell them something like, you know, we are poor. We don't have work. And so you have to look for the fees yourself. So please look for some work. Start making applications, look for some work. If it's a school where you can be able to teach so that you can get money for your school fees next semester, get shopping, and you get some pocket money for yourself. We, as your parents, we clearly do not have any way to help you. So, these students, immediately from school, they must start looking for work to look for fees because if they don't do that, they're going to suffer in the next semester. So they must look for everything. They must look for everything by themselves. So the word is they must get everything from the work that they do. So they send applications. Listen to this. Listen to this. They send router solicitation messages. They send RS messages. Those are the job applications. When they get a salary, 
That is the array message. That is the route advertisement. They send an RS message, job application, they get a salary, which is the array message, you know. And the array message, which is the salary, it has everything that they need. That is the student from the poor background. Now, the student from the middle to do family, when they reach home, the parents are going to tell them, you know what? We are going to work very hard to get for you school fees. Please look for work and get for yourself your shopping and your pocket money. Shopping and your pocket money and everything else, like clothes and all that. Eh? So you work, we will pay only school fees. The rest you look for yourself. Now, we have seen these three families where one student must look for everything by themselves from the poor family. Another student, they'll get, look for half of the things and they get half from their parent. And the other student, they get everything from their parent. When it's time to go to school, they just be like, mom or dad, have you paid school fees for me? I don't want to be sent out of school. Please, this time round, I need more shopping. The shopping you gave me in the last semester was not enough. Give me enough pocket money. My pocket money was done before semester ended. You know, like. So let's now fix this into context. So Slack, the first method. Slack is the student from the poor family. <laughs> because Slack, there's no DHP server in, in Slack. So here, the Slack method, the PC sends an array message, I mean, an RS message to the, um, that is uh, from the poor family. They send an RS message to the router configured with IPv4 address, IPv6 address. The router will have to provide, a, the RA message will have everything that it needs. The RA message will provide uh, the default gateway link, I mean, uh, IPv6 global link address, the prefix like DNS, so on and so forth. So that is Slack from there who are family. They have to go to work and everything is from the RA. Then you have the student from the middle to do family who get some items from the family or from the parents and the remaining they must look for themselves. So this student has Slack, which means uh, they send an R RS message. They don't get everything through the RA message. They get some of the things. The rest they'll get from their parent. They'll get from the stateless, a stateless DTP server. The rest they get from a server. So you get some things from Slack and something from the stateless DTP version 6 server. I'm going to talk about the difference between stateless and stateful. Then the stateful DTP server, this is the student from the rich family who does not have Slack. They don't go to work. They get everything from a stateful DTP server and no Slack. So the reason why we call the first server stateless is because that server does not keep a record of all the addresses provided. Every IP details, IP6 details provided, it doesn't keep a record of them. Okay. Uh, the one for stateful, it actually keeps a record. It keeps a record of every information of every IP that it assigns to any device. That's the difference between stateful and stateless. So stateless does not keep the state of the records. Stateful keeps a state of the records. All right. So that is the difference between these uh, three of them. Remember, uh, please don't forget, we will have a whole chapter called, we'll have a whole chapter called DHCP version six, where we'll talk about both of them. And uh, we will be able, you know, to um, we'll be able to to even configure them. Now, let me tell you one thing. During Slack, when the PC receives an array message from the router, normally the array message only provides the prefix, which is the network portion of the address, which you remember is 64 bits. Huh? The array message only provide the first 64 bits of the address. So the remaining 64 bits, which is the interface ID, where do we get it from? 
Now, to obtain the interface ID, which is the remaining 64 bits of the address, we have two methods. Okay. Either, either the device or the PC can obtain it randomly, can generate it just a random 64 bits and plug it on the first uh, 64 bit from the uh, array message and it makes 128 and the device can use it. Or it can be obtained using a method called EUI64. All right. It can be obtained by a method called the EUI64 method. And the EUI64 method is what I want to demonstrate to you guys here. So let me just get a notepad here. All right, all right, all right. Let me demonstrate for you the EUI64 process. Now, first and foremost, I need you to know that EUI64 process, it utilizes the MAC address, okay? It takes advantage of the MAC address. So you realize how the MAC address is very important, guys. Very, very important. Now, how does it, how does it uh, use the, uh, the MAC address to do this? So let's say our MAC address is the one provided here, the 48-bit MAC address. It's uh, FC. Uh, Colon 99, colon 47, colon 75, colon CE, colon E0. That is our MAC address. Okay. I'm going to put it down here. Now, so the thing is this this MAC address, we need, we need to know. Of course, we know these are 48 bits. If you wrote each of them into bits, of course, each of them will give us four four bits. Like you know that F will give us one 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 one. Um, C, which is a since A, A represents. Uh, let me tell you here. So we know that the hexadecimal numbers are made of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, sorry, 8, 9, uh, then from 9, we start from A, uh, B, let me just uh, zoom this uh, to take it up a bit. So A, B, C, uh, D, E, F. Okay. Where A represents 10. B represents 11. Okay. C represents 12. Okay. D represents 13. Okay. Uh, 14 is E and F is 15. All right. And I did told you guys that you know in ip version 6 we always just use 8 4 2 1 okay uh 8 4 2 1 whereby if you're having f here and f represent 15 so you ask yourself which numbers here when you add you get 15 we know it should be all of them 8 plus 4 is 12. 12 plus 2 is 14. 14 plus 1 is 15. So we will actually be having 1, 1, 1, 1. So if all these numbers, you need them, you need, uh, you know, if all of them, you can add them to give you 15, then you put a 1 under each of them. Look at a number like C. C represents 12. We ask ourselves. Which numbers, if you add, you get 12, that is 8 plus 4. And that means that if 8 plus 4 is 12, then you only put 1 under 8 and 4 and put 0 under um, 
under two and one, which means one one zero zero is C and uh, uh, 111, of course, is F. All right, so re we already learned these ones, guys, how to translate these numbers into binary using 8421. All right, so if we need to, we need to use the EUI 64 process, which is the extended unique identifier 64 process. We need to check what is the seventh bit, which means we, if we will write all of them into bits, we'll have 48 bits. But we only need the seventh bit, so there's no need on writing all of them into bits. What you can do is you can just write the first two numbers into bits. So we have seen that F, F is 111 and C is 1100. Zero, zero. OK, so we can now get the seventh bit. We can get the seventh bit and to get the seventh bit. We just need to count. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. So the seventh bit is actually here. This is our seventh bit. So what do you need to do with the seventh bit? And just put them together here. What you need to do with the seventh bit, which is this zero here, we need to flip it. How do you flip it? Since we are dealing with binary numbers, a binary is either a one or a zero. So if it's a zero and you want to flip it, it becomes a what? It becomes a one, it becomes a a one. So what we'll do, we now have a number like one 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 zero. I have flipped the seventh bit from a zero into a one into a one. Once I do that, I need to write them back to hexadecimal. We know that one 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 will still be what? It will still be F. OK, 111 will still be F. You can see that. Now this one has changed now. This is now 11110. 1110. One, 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 We're going to put it down here. So 1111. So 1, 1, 1, OK, so looking at one, 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 zero, the first one is eight. The second one is four. Eight plus four is twelve. Twelve plus two. Is what? Fourteen. So this number now is equal now to E. Is E, OK, and so which means our number here will change from C to E. And uh, the rest will remain. Nine, nine. Uh, colon four seven. Uh, uh, colon seven five. Colon C E. Colon E zero. Now, once we have flipped the seventh bit from a zero to one, or if it's a one, you make it a zero. Then you need to do one the last thing. This twelve hexadecimal numbers. In the very middle, we have we have six here, and we have six here. In the very middle here, we want to insert a constant number, which is F F F E. That's exactly what you do. We're gonna insert there. Actually, we do it here. F F colon F E colon. All right. So we insert a constant number here, F F F E. That is constant. That is uh, there by default. All right. So we now have FE9947, FFFE75CEE0. Now we now have a total of how many hexadecimal numbers here now? One, two, three. Okay. That is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, uh, fourteen. A, a 16. So if you multiply 16 uh, hexadecimal numbers, we know that one hexadecimal number has four bits, as we have seen here. What about 16 times 4? That is 16 times 4 is going to give us a total of 64 
bits. A total of 64 bits. OK, and this is something very important. This is the 64 bit that will be combined. With the 64 bit it we received from the uh, from the RA message, RA message, and that will form 128 bits. So you, you realize we have a few things in IPv6 which we need to take advantage of, and these are things we need to learn. All right, this is EUS 64 process, and it's been set in the exam before, so you need to know how to flip the seventh bit, insert FFFE at the middle, and you have your interface ID. You have your interface ID. Very, very important. Uh, the last thing we talk about before. Excuse me. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, excuse. Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, maybe, I don't know if I didn't get it. What determines the constant number? Because you that have number, said it, that, that it, Yes, mm. it's not determined by everything. It's a constant figure throughout. OK? OK. Yes, it does not change. It just FFFE. That is not decided. That cannot change. Uh, okay, the only thing okay. that will change, yeah, the only thing that is different is that every PC has its own MAC address. So the MAC address obviously will be different. That's what makes it unique. OK. Is that OK? OK. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. OK. So any other question, guys? Any other one, any other person, member of the class who wants to ask any other question? Um, you can do that. All right, all right. So let's look at the last thing before we can do some subnetting, as I promised you guys yesterday. Uh, hmm. Now, so the thing is this. Uh, we have, of course, the last thing is multicast addresses. And the multicast addresses, how do you identify the multicast addresses? Of course, I know that I had mentioned to you guys uh, that. Uh, so global unicast address, GUA, we identify either number, uh, any IPv6 address that starts with two or three okay link local address any address that start with fe8 okay unique local local address any address that start with fc uh, or fd then now we have another one which is called the multicast address so the multicast addresses, these ones, if you see any address that with FF, that is a multicast address. So please know how to identify your addresses. Eh? FF, FF, that is a multicast address. FF is a multicast address. And we do have two types of this multicast address. We have um, FF02, double colon one, and FF02, double colon two. These are the two types of multicast addresses that we uh, actually um, have. Now, at this point in time, I want to talk very briefly, very, very briefly about IP version 6 and how to submit it. Now, it is important for us to note that we needed the knowledge of IPv4 submitting to learn about IPv6, which is basically in about just two, two slides, two or three slides. Now, uh, global routing prefix, we have already seen the three parts of IPv6 global UFCAS address. We have the global routing prefix, which is 48 bits, the first three hexadecimals. We have the interface I subnet ID, which is 16 bits, the fourth hextet. And uh, of course, we have the interface ID, the last four hextets. So 64 bits, 16 bits, and 48 bits. That forms a total of 128 bits. Now, let me 
bring to you guys. Uh, I'm gonna bring my my the slide I was using uh, yesterday, and uh, it's actually right here. Okay, so the three parts of the IPv6 address, like I mentioned, is the global routing prefix. We have the subnet ID and the interface ID. So here now we look at the function of the subnet ID, which is the middle here, always 16 bits, and the interface ID, the interface ID is 64 bits. Now, subnetting, like I mentioned to you, normally happens within the subnet ID. Subnetting happens within the subnet ID portion. And you can see the part in red here, the part in red here. You can see the first hex state, second hex state, and third hex state. These are the first 48 bits. We don't touch this one when you're doing subnetting. Subnetting is always done on the fourth hex state, which is the subnet ID, which carries 16 bits. How is it 16 bits? Each and every hexadecimal number can be written into four bits. So if there are four and each of them can give us four bits, that is four times four, which is 16. Now, if we take a 2001 0db8 a card column 0001 uh, double column 64, we take the this network, the second network for one, we we gonna give it to this line here. We take 0002, this one, we give it to this line here, and you can see it here. 003, we give it to this network here between R1 and R2. 004, we're going to give it to this LAN here. Okay. And 005, we give it to this LAN here. Now, if we need to create another department or another network, we now want to see how can we subnet the first number here, the first network 0000. Okay. And let's see that. Now, a few things here that I want you guys to note here is as follows. Number one, yesterday we learned that because in IPv6, we don't have a problem with the host devices, I mean with the host addresses. So this will never subnet to get host or users. No, we have more than enough. We have 340 and the cillion. Those are 340 with 36 zeros. Okay. So our problem it's not to subdivide to get more hosts, no. Our problem is always to subdivide. If we get one address from the ISP, we can divide them into different sub networks, small networks within our own organization. So we only subnet in IPv6 to get networks. So what we do, we know that uh, we do subnetting on the subnet ID here, but yesterday when we had to get more networks, yesterday we learned, that you borrow bits from the host portion. In creating networks, you borrow. And in borrowing bits, you borrow from left to right. Okay? Here we don't we don't reserve. Here we only borrow. Okay? So we are going to borrow just like we did yesterday, but our borrowing is different. Here we don't borrow bits. Actually, we borrow a whole hexadecimal number. So we borrow one of these zeros here. So we take the first one. You see the zero. That's what we take the first one. And you know, each and every by hexadecimal number contains four bits. So since we are borrowing, since from here all the way to this side is the sub interface ID, which is the host portion, we are going to borrow one hexadecimal number, which carries four bits. So since the interface ID normally has 64 bits, we want to remove four bits, which is one hexadecimal number. So that 64 minus four will be 60. And Yesterday, when you did borrowing, we were borrowing from the host portion and we convert it, in, we, we make it to be part of the network portion. So here, we borrow one hexadecimal number and it becomes part of the subnet ID. It becomes part of the subnet ID. So that now, if you borrow the first column or the first address, now our, uh, yeah. Our subnet ID is now going to go beyond the 16 bits. It's now going to cover up to the first bit here, the purple column. Eh? So that's why 
the subnet ID was having 16 bits. Therefore, we borrowed this side. We actually add it to 16, and we now have 20 bits on the subnet ID. And now you can see we now have. If each of them gives us four, four times five is 20. Now we have 20 bits, and our subnet ID now ends here. The subnet ID now ends right here. OK. And you can see we are having slash 64. For the network portion, we now have six, uh, 64 plus 4, which is now 68. This side is now having 68 in total. OK, and so. That is the end of submitting for IPv6. We don't have much detail like IPv4, but we needed all that knowledge in IPv4 to understand this. Now someone can ask me, how can you assign this address now to, an, to, a, to a router interface or a PC? First usable address, you just need to put a one here. Okay. Second usable, put a two. And you put the one between the double colon and the slash. That is the first usable. Two, double colon, two. Three, double colon, three. Tenth, double colon, A. Twelve, eleventh, double colon, B. Fourteenth, double colon, uh, e 15th is double colon f okay and that is the end of subnetting for ipv6 it doesn't have so much issues and for us to understand this i now want us to do a typical example i want us to do an example so that you guys get to see exactly what happens so let me just uh all right, all right. Let me just look at, uh, yeah. 8421, I think so. Uh, yeah, this is one of the assignments I'll be sending to you guys, but I'm going to work on it so that you see we are actually going to submit both IPv4 and IP version 6. So let it just uh, let it open. And then we're going to see exactly how to do that. So it's already opened here. And it's a very interesting one. Guys, you will love it. But if you want to understand it more, take your pen and paper. Take your pen and paper. And let's move together on this. All right. All right. I mean, I, I want you guys to pay attention to this. We do this and then we call it a day for today. All right, we do this and then we call it a day for today. Now, uh, the instructions say here that, um, uh, of course, I'm going to send it to you guys. The instructions are very short instructions here. Let me zoom it in so that you can see. So we are told here that as a network technician familiar with IPv4 and IPv6 addressing implementation, you're now ready to take an existing network infrastructure and apply your knowledge and skills to finalize the configuration. In this activity, the network administrator has already configured some commands on the routers. Do not erase or modify those configurations. Your task is complete the IPv4 and IPv6 addressing scheme, implement both version 4 and version 6 addressing, and verify connectivity. So we're going to take some notes here. Let me bring my notepad here. So, uh, the first instruction tells us that configure the initial settings on branch A and branch B, including hostname, banner, lines, password, using Cisco as the user exec mode password, and class as the privilege exec mode password, and keep all the plain text password. I want us to skip that. We will do it at the end. I want us to go back, go straight to subnetting. All right. So LAN A1 is using this subnet here. I send the next available subnet to LAN B2 for a maximum of 250 hosts. Very interesting. Then, of course, we'll go to LAN B2, LAN B1, so that's LAN A1. So the B1 is using this network here. 
I send the next available subnet to LAN B2. Okay, finish the addressing. Then of course we'll go to look at the conditions here. Now, so let's do the subnetting first. So let's take um, first and foremost. I think you need to see the topology here. From here you have this is the uh, LAN A network where this is LAN A1 and this is LAN A2. So LAN A1 is having 500 hosts. LAN a2 is having 250 host. You realize that the 500 host is the is already in use. That network is already being used for LAN A1. We need the next available network for LAN B2, which is used as 250 host. So this is what we're going to be doing here. Okay. So let's write the address here. Uh, the address is 172.20.16.0/23. Uh, Right, we need to know that slash 23 is 255.255.255, not 255, 254.0. Slash 23, remember, because slash 24 is 255.255.255.0, slash 23, you subtract one bit, so you have 254.0. All right, so this is the network for this is the network for. Uh, 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 we're going to create here. Actually, we're going to create uh, that is the network we are given. We need to create network for 500 hosts. OK, so to create that networks for 500 hosts here. What we need to do is let me reduce the space here. Uh, 500 hosts. Um, the first thing we need to tell ourselves is, you know, we have 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Okay. We did learn yesterday because we need to find uh, 500 uh, and 250. All right. So you get the one for 500, then the one for 250, because we start with the largest number. So let's start with 500 here. 500 uh, means <laughs> we need to make here 256, which is 128 double, and we need to make here 512, which is 256 double. We know that to make 500 uh, hosts, we need the 500 falls between 256 and 512, all right? 500 falls between 256 and 512. We know that 256 is 2 power 8 because 128 is 2 power 7, 256 is 2 power 8, and 512 is 2 power 9. 2 power 9. So according to our first step, we need 9 bits. So to get 9 bits, going to our second step, which is reserve, because we want to reserve those bits and find our increment. Since we are dealing with hosts, we're going to reserve. So what do we do? Our subnet mass is slash 23. We need to write it into binary. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So 8 plus 8 is 16. 16 plus 7 is 23. 5, 6, 7, 8. So that is our slash 23. I write 23 ones and the rest are zeros. Then, after doing that, we now need to reserve the nine bits. <laughs> and to reserve nine bits, the nine bits we reserve from right to left. The nine bits are already reserved here for us, okay? So what do you do? We need to write our new subnet mask, which is going to be 255. Uh, actually, it will be what is here. Should just be the same here. Uh -huh. So obviously dot uh, two five five uh, dot uh, two five four uh, dot zero. You see our new subnet mask. And what about the increment, guys? The increment is going to be this number here which is two, the increment is two. So if our increment is two,
our increment is actually two. Then we now need to take our address. Which address that is it that we were given? We we're given 172 to 20 to 16 dot zero. Our increment is on the third octet, if you remember. So we are going to add. We're going to add the increment, which is two, to the third octet. So the, the third octet we were given was 16, plus two we get 18. Everything else remains the same. Everything else remains the same. And we need to get our range here, guys. So our range will be here. Look at this. Since the third octet here is beginning with 18, this one ended with 17. This one is zero. If this is zero, it means that our our uh, range there ended with 255. So I was asking yesterday, which number comes before zero is 255. Because the first one is zero, second one is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 100, 200, huh? 300. Oh, we don't reach 300. We reach 200, then 254, 255. 255 is the last number. When you reach 255, you go back to zero, which means before zero is 255, but after zero is one. Now, we have done, this is the network. For and this is slash will be slash 23. And this one at uh, the subnet mask will be 255.255.254.0.0. Okay. This is the this is the 500. This is the network for 500. Of course, you know it's slash 23. This is for the 500 hosts. This is for the 500. Post. Let me just move this here. This is for the 500 hosts. Then we go for the 250 hosts. Hmm? 250 hosts. We ask ourselves, 250 falls uh, here. Where does 250 falls? Between 128 and 256. This is where you find 250 here. Okay. So we can take 128. We take two, we take 256, which is two to power, two to power eight. So our bit is now going to be a eight, which means you're going to reserve eight bits. I'm gonna just do it here. So it means uh, when I reserve the eight bits from right to left, these are my eight bits. I convert everything else to one, to one. And now my subnet mask has changed here. I uh, can do this. Let me just do this here. Uh, I can do this. I'm going to put it copy and put it here. So here we are having how many bits? Eight bits. And in eight bits, which are these ones, this one becomes a one. And now our new subnet mask is 255. If you can see that, 255. And our increment is now. One. Our increment is now one because the last one bit here, that is our increment. All right. So we're going to take one and we add it to the third octet, which is still 18 here. So 18 plus one is what? 18 plus one will give us 19. So 18 plus one will give us 19 here. And so we need to get our range. Which will be 172 to uh, 172 to 20. Yeah. So if this is 19, the number that comes before 19 is 18. This is zero. The number that comes before zero is what? Is 255. This is now going to be slash what? Slash 24. And this is for the 250 uh, hosts. 250 hosts. And uh, at this point in time, Honestly, I need you guys to. I 
I need you guys to, um, anyone with a question, I need you to ask me any question at this point. So uh, any question, guys? Any question? I, I know there were a bit of questions yesterday. So I need you guys to just ask me a question at this point. I need you guys to ask me any question uh, right there. Any clarifications? Any, any clarifications? Any clarifications? On IPv4 subnetting, because I want to do IPv6 subnetting now. So I need clarifications on IPv4 subnetting. Okay. Please, uh, if you don't have any questions, I want us to, I want to clear some things here. These ones that we are using, I want to clear them now. And I want to clear these ones as well clear them and i'm gonna clear these ones as well the networks were given clear those ones and i can also clear these ones now and i can leave that and um, i'm just trying to leave space for ipv6 because ipv6 is another one so a few things we needed here to note in ipv4 first ip address For each of these addresses there. Or, uh, so, first, usable. Uh, first usable for the first network will be uh, 172.16. No, dot 20. Dot 16. Dot 1. Uh huh. That is the first because they needed the first assign the first IP addresses. The right interfaces. And it was the last IPv4 addresses. So I get the first, last, yeah. Last usable or last IP. I could just say IP, it's still okay. Last IP, of course, will be 172.20.6. Uh, you can see here. 17 sorry dot 17 uh dot 254 okay 254 that is uh the last ip because they are used they are required here at some point at some point here they are actually required now a question, please. Once you, yes, 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 please. On on that uh, first and usable IP. Uh, correct. Which one we, which one now becomes the, the broadcast uh, on the next um, on the next subnet. So this is our first subnet, the one for five hundred host. The broadcast is for this. Every network has its own broadcast. So the broadcast here is 172.20 to 17.255. That is a broadcast. We can never assign that to any device. For the second subnet, of course, the broadcast will be 172.20.18.255. Even that one, we can never assign it. Network address is 172.20.18.0. So we start finding from dot one, dot two, dot three, all the way to dot 254. So these two extremes, 18.0 and 18.255, we cannot assign. For here, 16.0, uh, 172.20, 16.0, 18.0, 18.255, 18.0, 18.255, 18.0, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 18.255, 
and 172.2017.255. Those ones we cannot assign. Is, is that clear? Yeah, it's clear. Correct, correct. So they needed for these two networks, they need us to create the first usable and the last uh, usable. So here you can also create first usable, which will be 172, add uh, 20, not 18, dot one is the first usable, last uh, usable, is 172.20.18.254. Remember all of them, all these addresses must have the same subnet mask. Slash 24. This is slash 24. This one is slash 23. Uh, this one is slash 23. Okay. And I need to differentiate the two of them. So this is uh, just to pick this up here. This is um, this is the first. Uh, just remove this. So the first range. This is our range here, and I can just bold it. Okay. And then this one is. So the first usable is here. Um, okay. So um, so those are going to be our first and last usable, and. And um, uh, the, the other three are actually going to be our first and last usable. So those are the ones that the instructions actually require us to, 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 to have them, OK? And that's why we have just calculated them. So please do mark. You must mark the subnet mask for each of them. Otherwise, it can be very problematic when it is now time to configure them. You will be con configuring them, but they'll be conflicting. They'll be conflicting, and that is why we need to mark our, our subnet mask. We need to mark our subnet mask. Okay. Now, so uh, I want us to look for if we have if we have no issues with IP uh, version four. I'm then very last one, buddy. Yes. I I have an issue. Correct. Um, from looking at the diagram. Correct. Uh, is it that we we are supposed to first identify the networks so that we can be able to know how many we be able to generate the subnets? No, we are given here. You see this first network here. We are told it has five hundred hosts. The second one has 250 host. Can you see that is given already here? Yes, yes. Yes, so those ones we are we are actually provided with. But I don't know whether I answered your question. Uh, they, there's something I saw. Uh, maybe okay. I need to understand more because I, from um, the way I'm looking at the, the branch A, the router branch A, okay. it's providing for us three networks. Correct. And then coming down to branch B, it's also providing us three networks. Correct. So in, when we are going to assign the IP addresses, are we are we supposed to because each and every interface of the bra, of the router will have its mm. own gateway, default okay. gateway, and then in that right. line, for example, if it's branch A, it's going to the LAN switch A. LAN A1, uh -huh. it will have its own uh, gateway, and right. then it will have its own uh, a range of IP. 
is it is it okay for yeah. us to arrange the, the the IPs that will be in that subnet? So that's a very good question. I think one thing I didn't mention when you are doing subnetting in this question, the IP addresses for uh, the interface going to to the cloud here, this central, these ones are provided for us already. So we don't want to we don't need to worry about them. We are only going to get IPs for this network, first network, and the first second network, where the first network requires 500 hosts and the second network requires uh, 250 hosts. The first network is called LAN A1, the second network is LAN A2. <laughs> to make that more clearer, let me look, let's look at the instructions. What do the instructions say? The instructions are saying that LAN A1 is using this subnet, the one for 500. Assign the next available subnet to LAN A2 for a maximum of 250 hosts. What we need to understand is that even though we are told the, the first LAN A1, which has 500, is using this network, we don't know the last usable. We don't know where it is ending. And that's why we needed to submit this and get the bit so that we know where it is ending. We needed to find the increment. Once you find that increment, then now we can now get the one for 250 and the, the other one. So we are given instructions here that LAN A1 is using this one, which we have already given to it, but you don't even know the range. That's why we had to subnet it. So we need to assign the next available subnet to LAN A2 for a maximum of 250 hosts. And then we are told here, assign the first IP addresses to LAN A1 and LAN A2. These are the ones for IPv4, which is LAN A1 is, LAN A1 has uh, 500 here, and LAN A2 has 250 hosts. LAN B1 and B2 are for IPv6. Then we are going to assign for IPv4 the last IPv4 addresses to the PCs. So PCs, by the way, the first addresses will be assigned to router interfaces. All router interfaces will get the first usable addresses, and the last addresses will be assigned to the PCs, which means, um, which means this one. that the first usable for the first network will be assigned for this router interface here, and the, the PC will be assigned the last usable, the 254, because the last usable, this PC, PCA1. PCA2 is each for the second network. It will get the last address here, and then the router interface, which is their default gateway here, will be assigned 18.1, which is the first usable. Uh, please keep on asking. Just answer until I ask you. I don't get tired answering questions. Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I haven't answered it yet. I am not. I am not the perfect. I'm not the holy of thou, you know. But I try as much as possible to answer because I understand this area very well. So, did I answer your question in any way? Or yes, you can yes, actually yes, put. Yes, you have. Uh, uh, my you my my. I did. I had not thank read you. the. I, I thought that the the, Sorry? the switches the switches had. I thought the switches had the villains. That was my worry, but I. Oh no, oh no, the, yeah. We have not been told to anything about the switches, so we just leave them as they be, yeah? Okay. All right, okay, thank you. So that's correct, guys. And uh, I wanted us to finish subnetting first before we go to the configuration, so that when we start, I uh, this is IPv6 uh, now. Let's look at IPv6. And in IPv6 here, we want we are told that B1 is given an address here. And I was trying to just copy it and uh, paste it here. If you'll accept. No, it is not accepting. So I'm going to write it manually. It's not able to, to pick it up. So it is. Uh, it's 2001 colon DB8. You can write these ones in small or capital letters, remember? Colon for day, uh, colon zero zero FF, uh, double colon slash 64. <laughs> this is IPv6 is always very easy, <laughs> very easy to submit. And you're going to see how easy it is. So it's D2001 colon DB8. Colon uh, Fade, colon zero zero FF, double colon slash sixty four. 
Now, this is a network address. How do we know it is not an IPv6 address? Because there's nothing, there's nothing between the double colon and slash 64. There's nothing between the double colon and 64. All right. So what we are going to do is this. What we are going to do is this. We are going. We are going to subnet this address and we're just going to find the first available address. This network is for uh, LAN B1. LAN B1, okay? And uh, I could just write it maybe at the beginning here. All right, for LAN B1. So that's LAN B1, okay? So for LAN B2, Okay, see what's going to happen, Richard. And I want you to be a bit keen here because this is important. All right. So remember what we mentioned today. We did say that subnetting for IP version uh, six happens. Sorry. Happens on the fourth hex set. This is the first extent, second extent, third extent, and we have the fourth extent. This is the interface ID. This is how we do subnetting. All right. And yesterday, if I can remember you guys very well, we say that if you if you have 19 plus one, okay. Uh, you're going to add 19 plus one. Uh, 19 plus one, we have uh, just formatting. Okay, it's not able to do what I want it to do. Anyway, 19 plus one, when you add it, nine plus one, we write a zero and we carry one. And we add one plus one, there we get two. So we get 20. Okay, we get 20. 20. So we said when you add nine plus one, you cannot just write 10 so that you get 110. Okay, you cannot get bring one down and then you have 10 like this. This is wrong because nine is always the last number among the decimals. Nine is the last number among the decimals. If you add any number on one, you now go to zero and you start you start from zero again. We also said that when you have two five five, let's say we have uh one dot two five. If you have one dot two five five and we add we add one to two five five. If you add 1255, you cannot get 256. You actually get a zero. You carry one. That one, you add it to this one here. And you get what? You get two. OK. You get two. So that your address will now be two colon, two, two, two point zero. You now have. 2.0 because you have added one to 255. 255 is the last number for IPv4 decimal IPv4 numbers. Every octet can only range from 0 to 255. So 255 plus one, you can't get 256. You write zero, carry one, put it here, and you get a two. Now the same thing happens with IPv6. Okay. In IPv6, F. Let me write a capital F. F is always the last number. OK. F is always the last number. And um, if I add. One to F. Remember, I, I talked to you about, you know, all those this uh, from zero all the way to, to F. F is the last number, which is 15. 
Okay. So in IPv6, if I add one to F, okay, if I add one to F, I there's no G. There's no G. So what do I do? I actually write a zero here and I carry one because it is full. I put one here and it becomes a one here. So it, it actually don't write it there. It becomes here one. OK, so. F is full. F is full here. If F is full and you add any one to each, you go to the next one is zero and you bring one to the next number here. What am I saying, guys? F is the last number. Nine, nine is the last number in decimals. F is the last number in hexadecimals. Nine is the last number in hexadecimals. 255 is the last number in IPv6. So that if you add one, let's say F we were having here, we are having here C, or we are having eight. If you are having 8F and you are adding 1 to F, F plus 1, you get a 0 here. You add a 1 to uh, 8 and you get your what? You get your 9. So your number will be 9Z, 9 zeros because F is full. Now we're going to apply the same method here because this is our, uh, this is our fourth hextet, which is the subnet ID. This is how we do subnetting. So to get the next available number, very simple. We just need to, because we are told to get the next available. We are not told to get like uh, how many networks, just the next available network. So we're going to, to if you have 10, eh, or you have a number three, what is the next number after three? It is four. So what do you do to three? To get four, you add one. If you want to get the next number after four, it's five. What do you do to four to get five? You add one. The same thing. So to get the ne next available network, we're just going to add one to F. And if you add one to F here, it's going to be odd. If you add one to F, it's going to be, um, it's going to be zero. And we carry one. We add one to this F here. And you add one. Okay, you add one. I just want to do something here. This, uh, okay, okay, okay. I know what to do. I know very well what to do. So you add one here. Uh, you add one to this F, it's also full. So we get another what? We get another zero. Okay, we get another zero. We carry one. We add one to this zero here. Zero plus one. You know it is one. Okay. Yeah. It is one. And so this zero just remains a zero here. Okay. So what happens? We had one, we wanted to get the next number. So we added uh one to F. We got write zero, carry one, put one to F. <laughs> we write zero, carry one, put write add one to zero, you get a one, and you bring down the zero. The rest remain the same. So the rest will remain the same the way they are. So this will be you copy that and I place it here. And I bring this here. And I put my double colon slash 64 here. And uh, there you go. That is the next available network. Any questions? How I have done it? I've just added one here and I found my next available network here. Someone asked me a question. Any questions, guys? How did I find the next one here? I just added one to F, zero plus one, zero, carry one, put here, and one. This is my next network. And if I check at the instructions, what the instructions are asking me to do, the addresses we are going to obtain from them. 
they just need me to find the first usable. And this time round, they want me to find the 16th usable. That is funny. That is funny. Very funny. So, uh -huh. let me just erase this. So, for the first network, we need to find first usable. And first usable is very simple to get, will be this one. This network, I uh, just copy, put it here, and the first usable will have a one there. That is the first usable. Okay. We need to find the 16th IP. Um, Usable and IP, I'm just doing the same thing. So I'll get that. And I'm going to need to explain for you something here. Uh -huh. No, I put it right here. A usable. 16th usable. Now, let's check this. Now, for the 16th usable, I want to see what is going to happen here. OK, now let's let's do something like this. I want you to get how do you end up at 16? So. The 15th address, you know, we have. We have the first, second, third, fourth, 15th, you know, 15. Is represented here by F. Okay. 15th is represented by F. So if you have F, F here, which is 15th, this is 15th. Okay. To get the next one, to get the next number after F, what do we do? We need to add one to F. And if I add one to F, um, if f plus one, I'll write here a zero. I'll write a zero here. f plus one is zero. f plus one is zero carry one, and we put that one here. Okay. So which means to get the next number after f, you actually get you add one. And you get one zero. <laughs> this is not 10. This is one zero because this is one hexadecimal number and this is another hexadecimal number. So one zero is our 16th. Please don't take it as 10. You know very well 10 in hexadecimal is actually A. So we cannot say that is the 10th one because instead of putting 10, you could have put A. But this is one zero, which means the 16th hexadecimal number is going to be here one. Zero. It's going to be one zero. And we do the same here. And uh, I want to get the first hexadecimal. Uh, put it here. And the first we just have a one here. And the 16th hexadecimal will be. Uh, we take the same address and uh, this time around we put here one zero that's our 16th hexadecimal okay so for ipv4 we have uh, we have this is lan a1 Okay, and uh, I, this is uh, the one for LAN A2, LAN A2. So we have all our addresses here that we are going to be using, okay? This is all that was needed throughout here. We are also given for IPv6, you must configure something called link local and the uh, link local address we are given here is in the instructions. It's FE, FE8, double colon uh, B. That's the link local we are given. So 
Each of these IPv6 addresses must have a link local, which is provided here. And we are done. This is all we needed to do so that we now be able to configure this device with the addresses. OK, and the other addresses, of course, are in the table there. So let's do this. Let's now. Let's configure these addresses here. I'm trying to check how. I'm trying to check how I'm going to be configuring them. Uh, without. Yeah, without having to compromise my network. OK, so that's it. Of course, uh, we are also are given that uh, no, there's no DNS. So. I'm going to start with the first router. Branch A1 here. Go to the uh, desktop here and um, I do EN uh, con T or configure terminal. Uh, host name, this is branch A1. Branch, actually branch A. Branch hyphen A. Uh, that is the host name. We needed to do that. Then I go straight to the IPs. I will leave you the basic settings to configure. Or if this time I'll configure them. So for this router here, I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to use the first interface is actually interface G00. And I'll check. I can do something here. This is the this is the. Um, you're going to be clever here a bit. I want to see because I've given three interfaces G00, G01 and G02, where G02 is given this other one here. So G01 and G00 and G01, I need to be smart to know between this one and this one, which one is G00. So what do I do? I want to say interface G0 slash 0. I press enter. I want to activate it and I want you to look at which of these interfaces is going to turn green. So I say no, shut down. When I say no shutdown, you can see the one that is coming up, which means this is our G00. This is for LAN A1. And I've just known my secret there. I've just known what I need to do. So I can proceed very fast and do my configurations here for LAN A1. So for the router interface, they were to get the first IP addresses. So the first IP address was uh, say IP address. Let me just make this one a little bit bigger here. OK. All right, so first IP. It's 172.20.16.1. Subnet mask was 255.255.255. .255 .255. Dot zero. Enter and you say no shutdown. OK, then. You can say. Description link to learn. A1. Done. For my second interface, which is with G01, I say int. I can exit here. Uh, exit interface G0 slash one. We say IP address, and the ad IP address is supposed to be now for LAN B. LAN this is for LAN A2 now, which is the first IP, which is 172.20.18.1. Uh, Subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 slash 24. That's correct. We say description is link uh, to LAN A2. OK, then I say no. Shut down, no shutdown. And we are actually done with uh, that router. We are done with this router. You can see the interface are all going to green. All the interface are going to green, which is they are OK. Now, before I finish up with this router, let me actually do the most honorable thing is to also configure interface. And exit. 
I don't normally have to exit. I say interface. I can just say the command short form is int. Int, which means interface. G02 is provided on the table. It's G0 slash 2. OK, I say IP address 172 is in the table. Dot 20, dot 31, uh, dot 254. Subnet mask is uh, 255, dot 255, dot 255, dot 252. Uh, enter, I say description. Link to central link to central c no shutdown and we're done with that interface so i configure my two LAN links and then configure the one provided on the table the one provided on the table i can minimize that i can now go to my two pcs because the pcs are give, being given the last ip addresses open this pc first one go to desktop go to ip configuration and give it uh, 172.20.17.254. Uh, subnet mask uh, should be the 255.255.254.0. Default gateway, hey, remember the default gateway is always the IP address of the router, the one, the first usable we give to the router, that will be the default gateway. So 172.20.16.1. That's a default gateway. I need to know. I need to know if. Uh, if there's DNS. And honestly, there's a DNS server here. Which is here. The IPv4 DNS server. All of them will use the same DNS. All of them will use the same DNS, which is 172.20.32.10. All right. And I'm done with this PC here. I'm going to just need to close it. And uh, we now go to the second router. We go to the second router. No, the second PC. PC A2 here. Go to desktop. Go to IP configuration. Bring it here. This is not the PC for LAN A2, which is given the last IP there. And the last IP there is 172.20.18.254. All right. Then the subnet mask here is slash 24. So 255.255.255.0. The default gate will be the First usable IP address on LAN A2, which is 172. 172.20.18.1. 172.20.18.1. 172.20.18.1. Uh, the DNS is the same for all of them. DNS is the same for all of them. And my DNS will be here. 172.20.32.254. No, dot 10, sorry. The 10. So I'm done with this PC here, guys. And I'm going to close it. OK, so I go back to. I go back to second router now, which is this one, which I'm going to give IPv6 addresses. So I'm going to click on that router, go to CLI, EN, conf T, and I give it host name is uh, branch hyphen B, branch B. And I need to know which interfaces am I talking about here. It also has uh, G00 and G01. So int, in short form of interface, G0 slash 0, enter. Look at which one is coming up. You're going to say no shot. 
the upper one is turning to green. OK, that is my G00. So I could say IP. I need to just say something here before I go to that interface. I need to say in this router to activate IPv6 in every router, you say IPv6. IT, IPv6. Um, IP was uh, version six what? Yeah, IPv6 uh, unicast routing. IPv6 unicast routing to activate IPv6. Uh, I get into that interface now. Go back and now let me assign it. Let me start with this rhyme round. I can start with the IPv6 address that we were given. We were given the one on the table. The one on the table is, is say IPv6. IPv6 address. The one on the table is on. Oh, oh I, it's not the one. Let me give the one we configured first. The one is subnetted are actually down here. So for I'm on land B1 for G00. I'm going to give it the first usable here. Which is here. So 2001 colon DB8 colon FADE colon 00 00 FF uh, double colon 1 slash 64. All right. Enter. I see. Let me give link local first. So IPv6 address uh, FE8 double colon B. A link hyphen local, link hyphen local, enter. I can give you the description. I say description is link to LAN B1. Okay. Then I'm just say no shutdown, it's okay. Then I exit and I go to the next interface, which is G0 slash one. Okay. I say IPv6 address. IPv6 address. I give it the. This is now the second LAN B2, first usable. I say 2001 colon uh, DB8 colon. Per day, colon uh, 0100. Remember, we can omit the first leading zero and just make it 100, but you can also just include this one, double colon one slash 64. So where there's 0100, we can still remove the 100, or you can include it. There's no effect to that. So we press enter and you say IPv6 address for link local. FE8 double colon B link hyphen local. Enter. We say description link to LAN B2. Enter and you say no shutdown. And we're done with that. Once we're done with the, both of them, we now need to configure what is uh, the interface on. Uh, G02, the one provided on the table. So we can exit or we don't have to exit. You can just say int G0 slash 2 and press enter. IPv6 address and it is 2001, 201, colon DB8, colon FFFF, colon FFFF, uh, double colon 2 slash 64. Okay. IPv6 address uh, FE8 double colon B link hyphen local. And that is done. We say description link to central. Link to central. Then you say no. No shutdown. No shutdown. Say no, no shutdown, and and that's it. So for IPv6, 
We have done the four interfaces and they are working very well. The only thing that is remaining now is we need to configure the PCs here. This PC is um, PC for B1, which is given the first usable IPv6 address. Here we come here on IPv6. I don't know that I can just copy and paste for LAN B1, the 16th address. I don't know that it will accept. If it does, well, and yes, it did accept. 00FF, put 10, put 64 here. Okay. For um, default gateway, we're going to give it the same as the link local. So, that's one funny thing about um, about IPv6. IPv6 normally uses the default gateway as the link local address. That is a funny thing we have with IPv6. So default gateway, link local is used for both of them. But now we need to provide the DNS server address, which is actually here for IPv6. DNS here will be uh, 2001 colon db8 colon fade colon 1000 double colon 10. That must be there. And we close that here. And we go to the other uh, PC, this PCB. And for PCB, we go to the desktop IP configuration. And we give it the last 16th usable of, of the IPv6, this one here. You can just copy it. Copy, and I'm going to paste it here. And I put 64 here. And I can remove this and put a bit there. And I can just copy that and put it on the default gateway. And for the DNS server, which is provided here, we just going to type it here is 2001 colon db8 colon fade colon 1000 double colon 10. And we are done with that. And we can close that here. And uh, remember, we have 65 over 75. So which means we have 10 more marks, which we can do them here. We need to be ending, guys. It's been a long class. So those ones we are told to configure in each router here. We can do that very fast. Enable for EN just means enable. Conf T, long form for configure terminal. So we're told to do what? Uh, host name. We already did host name. Banner, lines, and password. Cisco has the user exec mode password and class has the previous exec mode password. Yeah. So you say line, uh, console zero, enter. Password is Cisco, enter. Login. Uh, we can go to line uh, vit line vty zero to fifteen maybe. Uh, password is Cisco. Login. Okay. We exit and the other password for privilege exec mode password. The enable secret. Say enable secret and this class. Uh, we are told to put the banner. Saying say banner, MOTD, get them from your mind. We use uh, ampersand as my characters. We say this is a secure system. Where letters will be prosecuted with a full text. Extend of the loop. Ooh, that is my banner. Let me copy this banner because I'm going to use it somewhere else. Ooh, I just click here and copy. 
All right, but I can enter it there. The other thing was, um, so we have to configure the lines, passwords, banner, hostname, and encrypt all pentlex passwords. So we just say service password hyphen encryption. I'm using tabs key guys to automatically complete the commands. When I just say SCR, press tabs key, service, pass tabs key, password hyphen encryption, it automatically completes for you. So I have now 70, I have five more marks to go. I do that on this other router here. Uh, I get out first, I can start with any order. I can do banner, MOTD, and I press here, paste. When I click paste, the banner I had copied will actually come here, and I press enter. Uh, um, uh, line, Console zero, password, Cisco, login. Okay, line with TY, zero to 15. I can even use the previously entered commands. Put the app arrow key to bring for me password, Cisco, enter, login, enter. And I'm done with that line. I've already done banner, I've done the passwords. I need to say enable. Secret class enter and I need to say service password hyphen encryption. I press enter and that's it. I now have I have 75. If you do, I know it is very tedious. If you do that, this is the only uh, equation that normally has 75 over it doesn't have a hundred. So you're gonna want to work on it until you get 75 over 75. Very interesting, very detailed. Um, uh, as usual, I will, uh, of course, uh, post this on the, um, I'll post this on the, uh, on a link on the YouTube channel so that you can be able to, you know, go through it and you can do it like I did it, you know. It took me time to reach here. I didn't know this the first day I, <laughs> I started talking about CCNA. So you're gonna need to do, bit by bit, make as many mistakes as you can to be able to work on this, okay? I have recorded everything and you're gonna find everything on that YouTube channel. Otherwise, guys, I don't know whether there are questions here. We, it's already six minutes by eight o'clock and we need to stop here and uh, call it a day. And we meet tomorrow. Tomorrow is, I think, Friday. Tomorrow is Friday and I don't know what we are learning tomorrow. Tomorrow we are going to talk about uh, very simple things. Uh, ICMP and there's the transport layer. ICMP is very brief, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then we can talk about the transport layer. And in the transport layer, we talk about the uh, the TCP and UDP. You know, why is it that when you're streaming traffic live, how is it that it's able to be maintained at live when you're making a call over the internet or normal call by your phone? Which type of traffic is that? When you're sending an email, which type of traffic is that? Why do you say TCP is reliable and UDP is not reliable? You know, those are things we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, that's all for today. I think next week, next week we can finish uh, this part here. Then we see how to begin. Uh, this was the foundations. You agree with me? This is the foundation of computer networking. If you can't know the IPs, you can't know your OSI and TCP models. You can't know how to handle IPs. Uh, that is not a very good one. All right. So this is uh, very interesting. And I think, um, you know, let me stop there for today. Unless there are questions now, I uh, can uh, uh, now answer them. Can I answer those questions? Uh, is there any questions, guys, you guys might have? Yeah, if you don't have a questions, then of course mm -hmm. you can Excuse get me. Yes. Maybe a quick one. Yesterday I was trying to do for 